Well, I'm glad you joined us. It's Super Bowl weekend, if you care about that sort of thing. Matching up the the greatest quarterback of all time, and uh, and it's just going to be a, kind of a fun thing. Hopefully you get to enjoy that. Um, today we actually have Chris Goff, my friend, is going to be preaching for us. And he's going to lead us into a divine encounter with John the Baptizer and how he related to Jesus. So stick around for that. He's going to be trying to bring that idea out and that question of, uh, what does it mean to be great? Certainly, what does it mean to be great in God's kingdom? How do you be great? Have you ever wanted to be great? Well, take a listen and, and see what God has to say here. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. You know, bring, uh, bring a prayer request to us. You can email me directly, Aaron at Issaquah.cc, or use our Connect uh, page, or you can give online. You can register for upcoming services. We'd love to see you in person. That would be lovely if, if that works for you. Uh, we've got a touch-free environment. Uh, we'd love to be able to pray directly for you when you're there. Uh, for now, let's let's just pray and uh, sing a song together, and then let's get into that message that Chris Goff is going to bring. God, we thank you so much for the way that you watch over us. We thank you for your provision. We thank you that you are worthy of our praise. And so we just want to breathe a little, ask that you would make yourself known to us, that we could be present before you and that you would be present. great thou 
Measurement of greatness is faith. Today we watch this epic battle between two great teams who are facing off to figure out who is the champ, right? Who is the Super Bowl champion? We've got last year's MVP, right? The current, the current top dog fighting maybe the greatest of all time, Tom Brady, who was going for his seventh NFL championship. It's a big match, right? It's These are the people who beat everybody else. Who's the greatest? Which one of these people is the greatest? Everybody loves a winner. We love great people. Uh, we love excellence. We love to see things that we're like, wow, that must have taken years to build up the skill sets to be that great on the cello, to be that amazing of a painter. You know, we, we think of people in history, right? Alexander the Great conquers the known world by the time he's 31, you know? Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, who's the greatest composer? Who's the smartest? Michael Jordan, the GOAT, right? Greatest of all time. Six championships, MVP awards, gold medals, defensive, you know, titles, offensive player titles. Chris Goff, right? Class clown, 1990, Maywood Middle School. We think of these great people in history and we, we got to ask, what is it that makes them tick, right? What, what is it that, that makes them so wonderful, so great? We play a game uh, sometimes when we're driving in the car with our family where we pick a topic like uh, Nintendo characters. And then we say, okay, who's better, Toad or Yoshi? And then everybody votes. And then it's like, okay, Yoshi wins. Okay, who's better, Yoshi or Luigi? And we go on and we name as many characters as we can until finally we figure out with the amount, whoever's in the car has voted and the best Nintendo character is, you know, Mario or whoever. Um, we just love it. It's so fun because everyone loves a winner. Now, there's a difference as we look at the life of John the Baptist between great in the eyes of the world and great in the eyes of the Lord. In, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, it describes the terrible King Manasseh who uh, it says, in the eyes of the Lord, he did evil. He sacrificed children. He, you know, boom, 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 in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of the Lord. And what we realize is this is a terrible guy. But, you know, there's historic extra biblical information about Manasseh that says he was one of the most profitable kings in all of Israel, had the best foreign policy in all of Israel. He had peace treaties with everybody. And Israel flourished under Manasseh. Well, we wouldn't get that from 1 Kings 21, what we get is, in the eyes of the Lord, Manasseh did great evil. There is a difference between greatness in the world and greatness in Scripture. We know there is greatness in Scripture, however. Uh, in Ezekiel 14, we, we hear about a different kind of greatness. Ezekiel is pleading with God, God, please save Jerusalem. And God says to him, uh, Ezekiel 14, 14, Hey, Ezekiel, Jerusalem is toast. And then he says this, Even if these three great men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in this city, they could only save themselves by their righteousness. In other words, even if the three greatest people he kind of mentions, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were here, the city's still going down. I'd save them. And by the way, what's funny, God doesn't say to Ezekiel, I'd save you. He, so in other words, Ezekiel, you're also toast. But these three guys, I'd probably set them apart. We see this all throughout scripture. God says to, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, right? God picks this guy Noah. Because of your great faith, I'm going to start over with you. I, build me an ark uh, because it's going to rain and there's going to be a flood. And people are going to make fun of you the whole time you're building this. But because of your faith, I'm going to start over with you and your family. Daniel, right? The only character in the Old Testament who no fault is described or implied. In fact, God says later to Ezekiel, are you wiser than Daniel that no secret is hidden from you? Daniel was a contemporary of Ezekiel, but it's like, hey, Ezekiel, do you think you're Daniel or something? <laughs> um, Abraham, right? In his faith, he considers God a friend. And, and Abraham follows God, not even knowing where he's going. You've got Moses, who says he's the most humble man on the face of the earth. David is a man after God's own heart, uh, a man quick to repentance, a man full of fight. Elijah is taken up into heaven. In fact, even Islam holds Elijah as a great prophet because he fought the polytheistic idols with the monotheistic God. And then we come to this guy who Jesus says tops them all, John the Baptist. This is the person who Jesus himself calls the greatest man 
to ever live. Whoa, that's quite a statement. Uh, and so we, we, we see this idea that greatness is actually found, at least in the kingdom of God, through faith. The measuring stick is not accomplishment, right? If I achieve that seventh Super Bowl victory, I will be important. And when I'm important, I will belong, right? Achieve, be known as, uh, as being valuable, and then you can finally belong, right? You can finally be of worth. That's the way of the world. The way of faith, the way of the kingdom of God is a little different. It's obedience through faith. So, hey, Ezekiel, lay on your left side for 390 days and then on your right side for 40 days. You're going to have to miss some of the festivals. Uh, you're going to have to miss probably some birthdays, some key moments, may, you know, maybe the anniversary. Uh, you might even have to miss the elder meeting at church. Uh, but would you please lay on your left side for 390 days? What is that? What is that? What is this? It's something different. It's, it's a response to revelation. Hey, Nathan, go to King David, who can kill you, by the way, and tell him he's guilty of adultery. Hey, Abraham, leave your home. Hey, Farmer Gideon, you're now a mighty warrior. Go prepare an army. Hey, Fig Armor Amos, walk 10 miles to Jerusalem at the height of their prosperity and tell them to repent or it's all going to collapse. Hey, Peter, I know you're emotionally unstable, but you are now the rock on whom I will build my church. Hey, Paul, stop persecuting these followers and instead become one of them to your own persecution. On and on and on, we see these acts of faith through scripture. And then we see it in, in church history, right? Hey, hey, Bill Graham, you know, Billy Graham, stop, stop playing football. Tell people my story. You will tell kings, right? You will tell the story to presidents. Um, you know, I, I think of it even in our own community. Hey, Issaquah Christian Church, people are lonely at the retirement center. Reach out to them, encourage them. Hey, Issaquah Christian Church, reach out to the Goff family when they're sick and struggling. Pray for them. Let them know that, that, that they matter. You know, bring them, bring them food. <laughs> bring them encouragement. We've been the recipients of the faithfulness of this church. Heather and Aaron, you know, I, I give you a, a calling to, to lead this church uh, and open your home as a refuge for others. The life of faith is different. It's a different scorecard. It's, it's a response to revelation, right? Wives, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, honor your parents. Kingdom greatness, true greatness, is not measured by worldly accomplishment, but by obedience through faith. So let's unpack this idea of faith as, as kind of this measurement of kingdom greatness through the life of John the Baptist, right? As John the Baptist encounters Jesus, what do we learn about greatness? After all, he's the greatest man, according to Jesus, who's ever lived. Well, first, uh, the first encounter, there are four encounters. We're going to cover three of them um, now and, and a fourth next week. But the first encounter is, is interesting. The first encounter is actually in utero, the meeting of the Messiah, when John and Jesus first meet. They're both in utero in Luke 1, 39 through 41. Uh, if there's a question about when life begins, here you have engagement of two people while both in utero. The story gives us some sense of the, the importance, the salience of those who are in the womb. Mary visits Elizabeth and Jesus and John connect in the womb. Luke 1, 39 to 41 says, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So here you have Mary with baby Jesus in her womb, Elizabeth with baby John uh, in, in her womb, and the baby leaps in the presence of Jesus. Well, what a beautiful picture, right? This idea that when we encounter Jesus, we, we leap. We're like, oh my gosh, there it is right? Like beholding this perfect, you know, uh, God himself, the word, um, word made flesh among us. Uh, John got to leap first, right? He, he got to experience that early, early in life. And of course it says, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, which I say, and therefore John is filled with the Holy Spirit in this moment. And there's something remarkable about this guy already, something great already. The clarity to know the Messiah even from the womb. 
So she's filled with the Spirit. He's filled in utero with the Spirit. And, uh, and what we see is God's Spirit is all over the place in this story. The mother is filled. John, uh, John's father is filled. Um, they're met by angels, you know, and you see this great, this great thing going on here with all people, Mary, Joseph, everybody seems to be engaged with the Holy Spirit. And what we, what we take away from this is uh, the first lesson we learn with John the Baptist around greatness coming from faith is that faith is actually a gift. It's actually something given to us. What did Mary do to get the, the angel to come and visit her? What did Elizabeth or Zechariah do to get a visitation from an angel? It wasn't an enchantment. You know, they didn't set up an altar and make something happen. You know, I was at Barnes & Noble this week and saw, you know, just an entire row. Actually, it was actually larger, by the way, than the religious section. And it was called self-transformation. And it was Wiccan practices and chants and all this stuff, right? Here's how we can make stuff happen. Well, what exactly did Elizabeth do to get the angel to appear to her? I'm not sure, because faith is a gift. Faith is an offering from God. It's a revelation. It's an act of revelation. And John receives this even in the womb, right? In, uh, before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit shows up at particular times to particular people in particular places. Um, and, and it's the response to that revelation, which is interesting. I mean, even Saul, as he's fighting God's man, David, it says the Holy Spirit came on Saul and he began to prophesy. <laughs> There are stories of Bezalel and, and uh, being filled with the Spirit to, to work with fabrics and all kinds of crafts to build the tabernacle. There's all kinds of these stories. But the source of our faith is God. It's his revelation. That's the, that's the source of where our faith even comes from. And he bestows it upon us. So that's our first lesson from Act 1. Scene 2, we see John now as an adult in Matthew 3. And scene two, we learn that faith isn't just, it's not only a free gift, but it requires a response. Faith requires a response. Think of the call and response type of worship. You know, it embodies this life of faith. Maybe the, maybe the most famous kind of spiritual is Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. It was intended to be sung as a call and response. The preacher would sing, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And then the, the congregation would say, coming for to carry me home. And then he would say, uh, if you get there before I do, and the congregation would sing, coming for to carry me home. And it was this back and forth, this call and response to replicate and, and to you know, be, be a model for the follower of Jesus to say, God is calling, respond. God is speaking to you, respond. God is giving you a specific word for this moment, for this time, for this place, respond. And I love that call and response worship because it actually conditions our heart. It trains us that we hear and respond, trust and obey. Uh, the military, of course, understands the power of this. Call and response, right, is part of their exercise, right? I don't know what I've been told. Boy, the Marines are mighty bold. So it's like, whatever you thought of the Marines before, uh, I don't know what you've been told, but I'm going to tell you now what is the truth. The Marines are mighty bold. And it's this way of reorienting your perspective. I don't know what I've been told, but here's the truth. Um, and of course, they chant this while doing what? While walking, while moving, while going. I love that uh, at the end of Matthew, Jesus says, as you walk, as you go, make disciples. Listen to my voice, respond. You know, sometimes we pursue greatness even in our faith by trying to manufacture righteousness, by trying to manufacture a revelation from God. Uh, the Qumran community, they wanted to produce John the Baptist. Of course, not John the Baptist. They wanted to produce the prophet Elijah, right? The, the one who would come before the Messiah. They, they, they knew about this. They, they went out to the Dead Sea to be in the wilderness because they knew that, that this person would be pure and righteous, right? This new prophet who would come before the day of the Lord. This person would have to be pure and righteous. They knew this person had to come from the wilderness. They actually even knew that this person would bear witness in the Jordan Valley. So what you had in the time of John the Baptist was actually a lot of people going out and claiming to be a prophet, right? Claiming to be this person, um, 
Malachi 3 says, uh, describes the prophet Elijah who will come before the day of the Lord. Second Kings, you know, describes Elijah being taken up into heaven. And so the idea was, he's not dead yet. He's going to come back and prepare the way. Zechariah 13, 4 describes the camel hair on the prophet. Uh, and, and people actually get this backwards about John the Baptist. It describes the camel hair on the prophet being a sign that they're, they're false, a false messiah. And what I love about John was he had this humility that, that his faith was actually not his own. I'm going to wear the camel hair because I'm not the Messiah, right? The camel hair was, hey, that's a false prophet, you know? Remember, remember Jacob puts the, puts the goat hair on his arm to deceive his father. And John the Baptist, in his, his humility, right? Greatness requires humility. In his humility, he says, you know what? I'm going to dress like the false Messiah, because I don't want any mistaking. I do not want people looking at me. I want to be obedient to the revelation of God. I want to pull out an application for us here in this scene, because what John ends up doing in his ministry is baptizing people, right? How is he making straight the way of the Lord? How is he declaring the coming of the Messiah? He's calling people to repentance, He's calling people to repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And then he would baptize people in water. One thing that I believe is critical to us as we walk in this life of faith is understanding the power and the trap of sin. In other words, repent from what? Well, repent from your sinful ways. See, when a requirement of sin is that you shut off revelations voice. You shut off the, 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 the voice of God speaking to your heart, right? I must plug my ears in order to do what's in my heart instead of what God is calling me to do. And so I kind of go like this and I do what I know I sh should need to do. And I'm actually, I'm actually practicing not listening to God. <laughs> I'm practicing that. It's like, okay, here's how you, here's how you shut that voice out. When we're in Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of Jesus, we'll I'll talk, talk to you in a, in a minute. We have the Spirit in us that leads us to all truth. And so unless we plug our ears, right, we're listening. We're listening to, to God and his revelation. But, but in order to sin, we, we say, actually, I'd like to listen to the other voice now. I'd like to listen to that carnal voice of the flesh. I'd like to listen to the entrapments of the world, the accoutrements of uh, the comforts of this world as what I'd like to, to put my faith in. And of course, sin is a seed that when full grown results in death. Um, and so, so what we have to do is we have to actually plug our ears to the carnal voice of flesh and listen to the revelation of God. It's, it's the enemy's last ditch attempt to retain a follower of Jesus, to step back into those old fallen ways, to those old ways of death. And of course, what John is saying is, look, the antidote to sin is repent, turn from your old ways and follow Jesus, right? Um, and this, of course, is not a very popular message. Repent, make straight the paths for the Lord. And this is what John offered, a baptism of repentance, a conditioning of the heart, aligning us with truth, preparing us for God's new ways, right? Repent, the kingdom of God is near, it's right here. Let's get rid of this old way so that we can listen, for those who are not in Christ, I want to encourage you, if, if, you know, if, if you have not yet said, God, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. Come, live, live in me. I repent for my, my ways. I want your voice to be guiding my life. This is the invitation of Christianity, right? This is the invitation of God is I want to be with you in relationship. I want to speak to you. I want to talk to you. For those in Christ, we also need to repent. When we forget our first love, we need to walk again in paths of righteousness. Uh, when Martin Luther posts his 95 theses about 500 years ago, uh, these were the first two, right? These are his first two of his 95 statements. Uh, theses number one, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, in saying, repent ye, intended that the whole life of his believers on earth should be one of constant penance. In other words, what does it look like to be a Christian? It's someone who's always in repentance. Oh, Lord, I, I, I didn't listen. I, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> I repent. Please speak to me again, right? 
um, uh, thesis number two. The word penance, neither can nor may, be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, to confession and atonement as exercised under the priest's ministry. In other words, hey, repentance isn't some technical thing that you do because of, you know, going to confession and these different things. Penance is actually, repentance is actually an action of your heart. And, and uh, Martin Luther, in his, his call to reformation, it was a call to repentance. He was no different than John the Baptist. He was saying, repent, the kingdom of God is near. So repentance isn't just saying you're sorry, but it's reorienting your life towards the giver of life. And so here we have this invitation as we look at John's baptism, as we look at this, faith requires a response, right? It's the call and response, the life of, of following Jesus. And this invitation to say, uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, Godly sorrow leads to repentance. When we can see the, the broken ways that our, our sinful carnal self leads just to death, we, we see that and it, and it grieves our hearts and it leads us to repentance. And God is like, okay, thank you. You know, uh, God doesn't need our repentance, but God wants to keep talking to us. He wants to keep pouring into us. I heard someone say, no one rejects Jesus as a savior and no one easily accepts Jesus as the king. In other words, faith requires a response. It means Jesus is Lord. It means, it means our walk with Jesus requires us to put first what he says into practice in our life and not necessarily what we want to do. We have to start to love that discomfort, right? Uh, this is what I wanted to do, but actually I'm hearing this. I'm going to do this inst instead. Scene three, we have our, our third lesson as John the Baptist encounters Jesus. And here, I, here we, we see something, you know, that maybe is obvious, but faith has an object and the object of our faith is Jesus. So as we look at the death of John the Baptist, which we're going to unpack briefly, what we, what we take away from this is it's not just that John was a person of faith. He was a person of faith in Jesus. Faith in general, I'm not even speaking necessarily of, of Christianity, right? But any kind of faith requires an object. Consider a car. Like, we all want to get a reliable car. So you go to buy a car. It's like, well, you know, dad tells you, well, get a reliable car. You know, don't, don't go for some fancy thing that you're fixing all the time. Get a Honda, get a Toyota, get something you can trust in, get something you can have faith in. My friend Jason was driving uh, his family in their Honda Odyssey, very reliable car, uh, from Seattle to Tacoma to visit some family, and the transmission goes out. They were in a hurry. I believe they're going to a funeral. Transmission goes out. He gets the car towed to a, 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 a local shop, and they're like, hey, you need a new transmission. This is going to take a couple of days. So he just ditches the car. He's like, I'm done with this car. He buys a new car so that he can get his family to the funeral. And then he calls me and he says, hey, Chris, I just want you to know, man, I know you also have a Honda Odyssey. It's not reliable. <laughs> Whatever you thought about this car, it's not as reliable as you think. And of course, there's no such thing as a reliable car. They're always in a state of decay. They're always, the brakes are always going out. You're always running out of gas. The fluid's always getting low. The, the oil is always getting dirty. The parts are always wearing down. The car is in a state of constant decay. And we do all kinds of stuff to try to keep this thing going. But at the end of the day, there's no such thing as a reliable car. Best case scenario, we say, hey, this car has, you know, we've seen the end of this car time to let it go. It's been a good car, but it's time to let it go, right? That's kind of best case scenario with a car. But we, we put faith in, in the things that we trust and we depend on them, right? And as we depend on these things, whether it's a car or a relationship or anything, what happens is as we depend on it, our faith grows. Oh, this is reliable. Or the object of our faith is exposed as untrustworthy. So it's like, Hey, uh, I trust in my ability to dot, 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 right? We trust in maybe a skill set that we have. Um, and then one day that skill set lets us down and, and or somebody's better or, and, and, you know, we, ah, oh, man, I guess, I guess I need to find something else to hang my hat on. You know, even our own persona, we kind of trust in our, our humor or our, our intellect or our easygoing nature, or we, we kind of, we kind of turn ourselves into some sort of a meme, right? Like, 
uh, well, Chris, he's just kind of this easygoing guy and nothing seems to rattle him. Well, then it's like, well, okay, that's what people trust in me, so I gotta be that now. And we try to become the object of trustworthiness. We all know, though, uh, with the people around us in our lives that, you know, especially in your home, right? You know, your kids aren't perfect. Your, your spouse isn't perfect. You're not perfect. And all these objects of trust that we have, at some point we have to say, actually, I've got to trust in Jesus. I have to trust in something that will never let me down. This kingdom is not in a state of decay. It's actually, in a, it's actually building, right? It's actually growing. It's actually in a constant state of renewal. And this is this upside down kingdom, not one in decay, right? Law of thermodynamics, everything is in a state of decay, but the kingdom of God is actually always in a state of renewal. And that's the invitation we have. The object of our faith has to be Jesus. We see this uh, in, in Romans 5, where uh, Paul says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace on which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I love that because Paul is saying the object of our faith is Jesus. And this is where we see John's greatest act of faith. John tells his disciples who the actual Savior is, right? I'm wearing the camel skin. He's, he's saying, I'm not the Messiah. Instead, he takes his finger and he points it, even though he's great, he doesn't point the finger at himself. He points the finger out towards Jesus and he says, Behold, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Takes away, by the way, not John's baptism that cleans you of sin, cleanses you of, of unrighteousness, but a taking away, a burning away, right? The, John's baptism was with water. The baptism of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. It's a baptism of fire. It doesn't... It doesn't just clean the sin until tomorrow. It burns it away. It removes it. It gives you the opposing voice of the Holy Spirit to say, this is not where life is. And so John knows. He doesn't point at himself. He points out at Jesus. And this is, to me, this is what makes John so great. Here he has this intense following, all of these people coming out, traveling out to the wilderness to see him. And not just not just people who are down and out, but you see the Pharisees there. You see city leaders there. You see the Sadducees. You see him arguing with them. Hey, you brood of vipers. He's calling them out. Why? Because he doesn't care what they can do to him. He's following the voice of God. He's following in obedience. And his faith has an object, and that object is Jesus. One of the things about great people, right, is you want to be around them. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been kind of like starstruck. You ran into someone. I remember one time I was at the Issaquah Costco and Jimmy Carter was there signing books, right? And I remember it was like, I mean, I was trying to find, the, there was a line that went all the way around Issaquah Costco. I, I go inside and I look and I got about 10 feet from Jimmy Carter and I was like, wow, there's Jimmy. Like that's a, that, that was a president. Like I'm looking at a president. I'm 10 feet away from a president. And it was so cool because we love to be around greatness. Like we love to be, interact with this. By the way, that's what kills great people is them trying to become the object of faith for others. This is why the, the lives of the rich and famous are such chaotic messes often. It's because they're trying to remain a, a, an object of reliable faith. But Herod was one of these people. Herod was fascinated with John the Baptist. He, he, was, he was like, what is going on with this guy, you know? So what happens is John the Baptist preaches and he says Herodias, which is Herod's wife, Herodias and Herod's marriage is, is, is a sham. Herodias left her husband to be married to Herod. Her husband, by the way, was Herod's brother. So you have this crazy... Like she leaves Herod's brother to marry her brother-in-law, Herod, and John speaks out against this. And of course, Herodias hated John, but Herod was kind of fascinated with John. So they arrest him and multiple times Herodias tries to get John dead. Multiple times Herod blocks that from happening because he's kind of afraid of John the Baptist. He sees there's something going on with this guy. And maybe you know the story, but Rodius' daughter uh, Salome does this beautiful dance. She entrances everyone, and Herod says, I'll give you anything in my kingdom. So Herodias is like, have him take out John the Baptist. So she asks 
Herod to kill John the Baptist. I want his head on a platter. And here we have a pretty fascinating story, but Matthew 14, 9, it says, the king was distressed because of what he said, the oath he made before his dinner guests. In other words, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to kill John the Baptist. That's the wrong thing to do, but all these people are looking at me. So what am I going to do? Who is the object of my faith? Who will I follow? Who will I listen to? And so, of course, he listens to the people, right? He, he doesn't, the object of his faith is in his popularity. It's in, it's in the people. It's in his, his desire to be seen as a great king. I can give away anything in the kingdom. And in order to keep up his, you know, persona, even though he's distressed, and I think even though he knows it's the wrong thing to do, he has John's head brought on a platter, and this ends the life of John the Baptist. In God's kingdom, there is only one object of faith, and that's the king. This allows us to love others without making them false idols of faith. Like David, we, we hate sin, but we love to forgive it because we, we weren't depending on you to be the object of our faith. And in Hebrews 11, you know, as we, as we look at this kind of hall of faith, we see all this by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Aaron, by faith Jacob, by faith all these people. And then it says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the furies of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses were turned to, turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortures and refused to be released so that they might gain a be better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. For God planned something better for us, so that only together with us would we be made perfect. We have this invitation as we follow in faith, as we follow God, to make him the op object of our, of our faith. John says, Behold, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. One whose sandals I'm unworthy to untie. You know, I'm going to baptize you with water, but here comes one who can baptize you with fire. Here, here comes someone you can actually put your faith in. So all my followers, all my disciples, don't follow me anymore. Follow him, right? Paul says, you can follow me, but only as I follow Jesus. The object of your faith is not Paul. The object of your faith is not John the Baptist. It's Jesus. Herod missed it, right? He saw, you know, after, after John dies, Herod wants to now meet Jesus. Why? Because he thinks, hey, maybe somehow the spirit of John the Baptist went into Jesus. And so now he's looking at Jesus and literally thinking, hmm, maybe that's the new John the Baptist. He's got it completely upside down. John is trying to point to Jesus. Herod is literally looking at Jesus and applying John the Baptist. We, we, we do this all the time. We, we apply, you know, a Donald Trump, that's really Jesus. Black Lives Matter, that's really Jesus. You know, Democrats, Republicans, that's really Jesus. Our word, that's really Jesus. Our, our, our ability to meet deadlines, that's really what Jesus is. We all have this secret thing, and we try to turn Jesus into that. But, you know, Jesus will not be held down. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, not cleanses, takes away the sin of the world. And even Jesus gives us this ultimate invitation, not my will, but yours be done, to follow the good way of the Father. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for uh, the ability to have an object of faith that's trustworthy. Lord, we thank you that faith is a gift from you. We thank you that, um, that you allow us to participate with you, that you're not just giving us something to think about, but you're giving us something to do. You're giving us an action to partake with. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the example of John the Baptist, but I thank you for the example of our brothers and sisters here at Issaquah Christian Church. As we walk together in, in faith towards Jesus, Lord, we get to see and, and 
you know, encourage one another. Hey, I see what you're doing. Thank you for that. You know, um, we get to walk with each other, point each other back towards Jesus, up, lift up the name of Jesus together, and then watch the way that our life of faith unfolds in a hurting world who places their faith in things that do not have life. So Lord, we thank you for your life-giving grace. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And we thank you that ultimately we can have faith in your conquering of death on the cross. Lord, would you help us to join you in saying, not our will, but yours be done. Amen. As we step into our time of communion, um, I'm just thinking about what Chris said there and, and those those words from Romans chapter 5 and our peace with God that comes through faith, faith that works itself out in obedience, but that faith that comes from God as a gift. Uh, that's just a beautiful, a beautiful picture. Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord, our Master, Jesus, the Messiah, the King. Through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Of course, it talks about our sufferings as well as we map over his sufferings. Because that's the kind of God he is. He suffers with us to bring us into faith with God and ultimately peace with God. Unity and community. Union and communion with God and each other. So we... We take the bread and we're reminded that Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup, this new covenant in Jesus' blood is for us. So we drink to Jesus, our Lord, our Master, Messiah, and King. stage and set the sound and lights ablaze if that's the measure you must take to crush the idols jerk the pews and all the decorations too until the congregations few then have revival Tell your friends that this is where the party ends Until you're broken for your sins You can't be social Then seek the Lord and wait for what He has in store And know that great is your reward So just be hopeful Cause you can sing all you want to Yes, you can sing all you want to. You can sing all you want to and still get it wrong. Oh, worship is more than a song. Take a break from all the plans that you have made And sit at home alone and wait for God to whisper Beg Him please to open up His mouth and speak And pray for real upon your knees until they blister Shine the light on every corner of your life Until the pride and lust and lies the word and put to test the things you've heard until your heart and soul are stirred and rocked and broken cause you can sing all you want to yes you can sing all you want to you can sing 
all you want to and still get it wrong. Oh, worship is more than a song. We must not worship something that's not even worth it. Clear the stage. Anything I put before my God is an idol. Anything I want with all my heart is an idol. Anything I can't stop thinking of is an idol and anything i give all my love is an idol because we can sing all we want to yes we can sing all we Clear the stage and set the sound and lights ablaze If that's the measure you must take to crush the idols Well, I'm so glad you've joined us. It's good to be together. Um, I was encouraged by the message today and, and uh, I'm thinking about my own sense of faith which is a believing loyalty, you know, that it's a gift from God and and uh, I, I want to be able to respond back to him, you know. And, and so maybe this week, would you just uh, ask him to give you a great faith, a great sense of, of believing loyalty in him, that you would pursue him. Uh, because we know that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So may you be richly blessed. May his face shine upon you and uh, be gracious to you in this coming week.